everyone, my name is Joshua Harris and I am one of the pastors here at Integrity Church. And we are so thankful to have each and every one of you joining us for our online service. Just before the preaching starts, let's just take a moment to pray together. Father, we are thankful that you are sovereign God. And even in challenging times like this, you are still in control. And help us, Lord, to rest in that fact. Lord, we pray for this morning's service that as the word of God is preached, that hearts are challenged and lives are changed. We pray that even in these circumstances that we would be active listeners and we would be ready to hear and receive your word and that we, would be al- that we would allow our lives to be changed, to be made more like you. Father, we pray that you receive the glory for everything that is done this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Lord, over all creation. That you are good and you are kind and you're ruling and reigning on your throne. And God, we thank you for the work of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone and the foundation of our salvation, of our redemption in you. God, we pray today that you would help us hear and understand your word, that you would show us who you are and reveal to us more and more of your nature and of your character and of your gospel as we dive into your word today. God, help us, we pray. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, Integrity Church, hope you're having a great morning. And this morning, we are going to be in 2 Peter chapter 2 in our series entitled Church Scattered. I hope you are scattering well as a church family. hope we're loving one another, reaching out to one another. And I hope you've really invited somebody in your well in this season, somebody that can offer encouragement and help and accountability to you as you're trying and striving to, to read God's Word and, and to just to really have this time of, of meditating on, on who God is. Uh, we do have a reading plan available for you online. If you go to our website, liveintegrity.org, you can find a, a reading plan there. And we can, we were, we're supposed to be reading through First and Second Peter together. So I hope you're doing that. And I hope that you have somebody in your life right now that you're sharing God's word with, that, you're, that you are walking in love with. And I just hope that this is a good season uh, for you. Let me jump into Second Peter chapter 2 this morning. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3. And let me pray for us before we jump in. Father, we are so grateful that we get to, to have this time together, uh, even though we're scattered, but we get to, get to have this time together. And, and help us to take advantage of the sweetness of this time. Even though we are uncertain, uh, even though we are suffering, uh, maybe perhaps some have lost their jobs, some are sick. Uh, I pray, Father, that we would really trust you. And Lord, we even saw last week in, in your word, uh, that in times of suffering, you often speak the loudest. So might we pay attention to what you have to say to us, and might we become more like you. And Lord, we know in your word, you tell us and you promise us that even through trials, that Lord, it can develop this perseverance and this faith and this love for you that perhaps we've never had before. And so God, I pray that you would develop that as we are in our hearts, as we are a church scattered. And it's in Christ's good name. Amen. Second Peter chapter 2, we'll look at verses 1 through 3 this morning. Uh, back in high school, a, a close friend of mine, uh, he visited New York City with a group of friends, and uh, he was touring the city this one night on, on this trip, and on, uh, one of these nights he was near Madison Square Garden with a, with a, a small handful of, of the group that he went with. And he, he met someone who was on the street and was selling tickets. And he said, man, if you guys want to see a game tonight, you can see the New York Knicks play the D Detroit Pistons. And here, you can buy the tickets from me right now at a discounted rate. I'm not going to go to the game. You can buy my tickets. And he had four tickets. I think it was my, my friend and three other people. And they were like, oh, absolutely, we'll go. And so he showed them the tickets. Here's the tickets. Here's the price. And I think you already know where this is going, right? He, buy, he sells them the tickets at the discounted rate. As soon as they walk toward the stadium, they begin, they're excited, they're high-fiving each other, we're going to go to a game tonight, we got discounted tickets, and they notice the date on the tickets, and the tickets that they were sold were from the week prior, and there was no game that night. And so here they are in New York City, high school kids, and they just got scammed. They were deceived because really of their naivety. They had no idea that they were being deceived, and they had no clue to read, really, the fine print. It, maybe there's a story in your life where you, too, were deceived, and you remember, as my friend did, paying the price for it. Uh, you were scammed, or you were deceived by someone that you were supposed to trust, or someone that was supposed to love you. Well, interestingly enough, this is what's happening in the early church. 
Uh, Peter is writing this letter as Christianity has rapidly grown and become more influential, so much so that Rome had pushed the Christians out of the major cities and into, uh, the, into obscurity, and that's why the church at this time was scattered. Now, to add uh, to the problem of their scattering, there was also false teachers that were coming with in infiltrating the church and presenting a false gospel. That they would use the message of Christ to manipulate believers to, to bring harm to them and to lead them astray. And so Peter writes this letter with the hope that the church would be aware of these false teachers, that the church would be aware and they would not be naive. He, he wants them to have this knowledge, but that this knowledge would lead to a discernment that would allow them to, to read the fine print and not be deceived. But, but here's the thing. We have the same warning that Peter had, had, had then. We have the same warning today. In fact, I would argue that we need this warning more now than ever. When you read the New Testament, you'll see that in the last days, and I believe that Pentecost all the way to the second coming of Christ is, is the last days. And so we're in this season of belief. We're in the season of the church. So in the duration of the history of the church as we know it, the, the words of Christ are prevalent. We see it in Matthew 24. Jesus says that we're going to see a, a rise in wars. We're going to see a rise in diseases and corruption and, and, and false teaching. And so in the midst of this, it's important that the believer is not naive, that we know how to read the Word of God and we know how to grow in discernment. And so last week we ended chapter 1 with this confidence in God's Word, that God's Word is all-sufficient, that God's Word is true and it's reliable. And now we're going to see, beginning in chapter 2, uh, some of the reasons why that is. And so I'll begin in Second Peter chapter 2, and we're just going to read verses 1 through 3 this morning. It says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false prophets among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them in, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Now it's interesting the way that Peter describes false teachers here. Because it, it becomes sort of a, a template. For what you see in the New Testament. For instance, Jude says something almost exactly the same. He says in, in Jude 4 and 5, it says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So if you, if you read Jude uh, 4 and 5, and you read Second Peter 2, it, they're saying this, sort of the same template of what to look for, how to not be naive with false teachers. First of all, both talk about false teachers coming from within the church. Second of all, they, they deny the master. They deny Christ. And third, they will use their freedom in Christ as license to sin, or they would lose what they would call freedom in Christ as license to sin. And fourth, their destruction is certain. Now we're going to look at the fourth one next week when we, when we unpack uh, verses four through the rest of the chapter. But, but this week we're going to focus on those first three, that false teachers come from within, that they'll deny the master, and they'll use their supposed freedom in Christ as license to sin. Now, even though these are mentioned 2,000 years ago, it doesn't mean that this word is, is not relevant. 
Uh, sometimes we hear about false teachers and we think, okay, this is a sermon about false teachers. Man, this doesn't apply. There's no false teachers around me. This is an issue for, for me. Or that's extremely rare. Or it won't happen in our church. Or it doesn't happen in our church. But, but the question is not really whether or not you've heard the voice of false teachers. Because you probably hear false teachers every single day. The question is really, can you actually discern when you hear of false teachers. Because if you turn on the television, if you listen to the radio, if you listen to podcasts, if you keep up with the news or you keep up with social media, you are being exposed to some sort of false teaching. And and here's the hard part. If you cannot in recent times recognize that, that that you've been exposed to false teaching then you're probably already falling into it in some way. And so Peter's saying, don't be naive. So the first warning that that Peter gives is that the false teachers will rise from within. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 24, verse 24, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, even those who've been chosen before the foundation of the world, even those that Christ has died for. He says they have the ability, the false teachers can even lead those people astray or distract them from the gospel by which they have been saved. In in Acts 20, you see Paul writing to the Ephesian elders. You see the church of Ephesus explodes so much so so that the the whole continent or the whole region of of Asia in that time knew of the success of this church, that it grew and people were saved and the impact that it made on Ephesus. Yet Paul writes to the Ephesian elders in, in Acts 20 to be careful because fierce wolves will come not from the outside, Side, but will come from within and they will lead some astray. He later writes to, about the same church to young Timothy. In, in 1 Timothy, the, the exact same warning that, that churches will have false teachers that would come from within to lead some astray. In fact, nearly every letter in the New Testament deals with some level of suffering and false teaching that has infiltrated the church or that is about to infiltrate the church. In other words, false teachers can appear like sheep, like believers, but Paul calls them fierce wolves. That they look like sheep, but they are truly wolves. Now it's not that the false teacher enters into the church and makes an announcement, I'm a false teacher. It's not that someone's looking like a sheep and says, they wake up one day and they walk into the church lobby or walk into the auditorium and says, I'm a false teacher. It's not like, uh, I don't know if you watch The Office, but Michael Scott, when the boss, he's, he's, um, he's declaring bankruptcy. And so he thinks declaring bankruptcy is walking into the office and saying, I declare bankruptcy. A, a false teacher is not going to walk in and say, I'm a false teacher. No, Jesus actually says they, they, they perform signs and wonders. They can be people who serve or or volunteer or appear genuine or appear generous. But a a true discerning believer is quicker to see the true colors of a false teacher. How? Well, what's one of the biggest signs? Notice again verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 2. He says, even denying the master who brought them. That's one of the signs of a false teacher, that they deny the master who brought them. And again, this won't be a loud denial. It'll be a subtle denial. This is why many cults will call themselves Christians. If you see even in our country, some of the mainline different religions will say that them and Christians are the same. When there are some small subtle changes that lead to massive ramifications. If you think about golf for a moment, oftentimes what happens with golf, and this is the reason why I don't play golf, that if you have a subtle change to your swing, it can completely alter the direction 
of the ball. This is why your hands have to be, you have to have a good grip on the club. You have to ha- have a good follow through. You have to have your feet square. It's not like Billy Madison who just went up and ran and hit the ball as hard as he could like a hockey puck. No, the slightest turn to your wrist or the angle of the cl- club can cause you to, to completely alter the direction of the ball. You'll either slice it or you'll hook it. It won't go the direction that it's supposed to, do, to go. And with false teaching, it's the same. The most subtle change to the gospel, the fact that Christ lived a perfect sinless life, the fact that Christ went to the cross on our behalf and died in our place and resurrected from the grave and believing that by faith that truth happened and that the cross of Jesus Christ applied to you that if you confess your sins and repent to him and ask him to save you anything else beyond that truth anything else by grace by which you've been saved through faith any subtle change to that can change the direction of your life in a really dangerous, destructive way. Let me give you an example of how this even happened in my life. Early on in my Christian walk, I remember hearing a sermon on Philippians 2, verse 12. It says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, a lot of different opinions, there's a lot of different opinions about that verse. And in the sermon in, in this setting I heard the sermon, and and the sermon was about how you can earn your salvation through good works. That's what they did with, this is what this pastor did with this verse. That that if you can earn your salvation through good works, and you should be afraid that if you don't have enough good works, that God was going to punish you, and God was going to send you to hell, and you would not persevere. So you can imagine hearing this, and the terror of hearing this as a, as a younger believer, and, and as a result, I became uh, more legalistic in my walk with Christ. I became perform- performance-based be- performance based in my faith. I, I began to be diligent in my devotion uh, to God, not out of genuine love for Him, but out of fear that if I didn't do it, that if I died that day, I was going to go to hell. And so it was this sort of view of, of perseverance, that I wasn't going to persevere, that I wasn't going to, uh, that I w- would not be saved forever that, uh, as, until I met Christ. And so it was just this big fear that I had that if I didn't perform well, then God was going to separate himself from me forever. And so it's kind of subtle, right? I mean, you can, le- you can read this verse and sort of make that conclusion if you don't understand what this verse means. However, if you read Philippians 2 and you read ver- Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But verse 13 helps you understand the, 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 the bulk of the, what, what Paul is saying here. Verse 13, it says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so what Paul is really saying here is that he's saying that the Holy Spirit's work is already in you, and the fear and trembling is trusting God and his sovereignty, knowing that it's not this fear of living in in eternal torment. It's this fear of just really trusting God and working out what is already in us. Because the life of the believer is not to be afraid of eternal torment. So notice, there's there's a seemingly subtle change to the gospel with a message like that, but notice the ramifications. It put me into a performance-based religion and not the gospel of grace. And so here's how we know. If we're discerning people, false teaching from the true word of God, that the false teaching will alter the gospel of grace. And this is why we must not be naive, friends. This is why we must pay attention to what's being taught. This is why we must search it out uh, for ourselves. But look at verse 2. Again, he says, And many will follow there, the false teaching, the false teachers, sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed... They will exploit you with false words. Now, some scholars believe that what's likely happening here is that the false teachers produced or promoted this false 
view of freedom in Christ, which, pro- which allowed believers to fall into sin. And this is most, mostly related to, in this, in this context, sexual sin. And it was sort of this view of God that said, um, God is going to forgive you anyway, and you have freedom in Christ, and so sleep with whoever you want to sleep with. Do whatever you want to do to your body because this world that you live in is just temporary and you're going to be in eternity with Christ, so, so it really doesn't matter. And this is what was sort of this, this sort of false teaching of sensuality. And there's another word for it, and some of your translations may use this word, is licentiousness. In fact, you see this in, in the context of licentiousness. It's kind of, I have license because I have freedom of Christ to do whatever I want. And so there's this tension here that, where you see in, in the Bible and in, in, in our faith, you see this pendulum that swings of, of two different sides. Uh, Tertullian actually says, Just as Jesus Christ was crucified between two thieves, so the gospel exists between two heirs. And really what, what he's talking about is the, the tension between legalism and licentiousness. Legalism is when you add extra ideas, extra rules, extra preferences to the gospel or what Scripture actually says. This is why legalism is not the gospel. This is why legalism is a false gospel, because it's adding to based on someone's personal preferences. It's saying that you are in sin if you watch this type of movie. You're, you're in sin if you listen, listen to this kind of music. Or you're in sin if you drink alcohol. or Whatever it is, it, it becomes something that the Bible doesn't necessarily say. It's adding rules in, that the Bible doesn't add, that the Bible doesn't communicate. That's legalism. Now licentiousness is the other end of the spectrum. This is when you say, well, I'm free in Christ. I can do whatever I want. I can drink as much as I want. I can, I can go wherever I want to go. I can hang out with whoever I want to hang out with. I can sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. And this is equally as destructive and equally false as legalism. If you've been a believer a while, maybe you've seen this pendulum swing even in your own life. Specifically, if you grew up in a more uh, legalistic upbringing and, and you, then you started understanding the gospel of grace, maybe you swung too hard to licentiousness. Or maybe you grew up in a, in a family with or a house of no rules and you didn't have uh, a, a faith to, that you belonged to and you, you had no boundaries. And so what happens when you begin to understand the gospel of grace? You ran toward legalism because you wanted the rules and restrictions because you wanted to feel safe. But both are dangerous and neither produce genuine fruit. I want you to see that, that licentiousness, legalism, neither produ- produce real fruit. Neither produce real life change. And this is Peter's warning against the false teachers. This is why Jude says, and we read it in Jude 4 and 5, he says, these false teachers, they're ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. These false teachers were coming into the church, appearing to be believers in Christ, but teaching that if we're under grace, it doesn't matter what we do. When he says, they're saying, our eternal, our, we have eternal security, right? It doesn't matter what we do. Paul says the opposite. You see it in Romans 6, verse 1 and 2. He says, but what, we, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin live in it? So this goes back to an elementary issue around the gospel. And here's the elementary issue. How do we know if someone's truly a believer? By their what? By their fruits. How do we know if someone's a false teacher? The same thing. Because a false teacher will not just be false in their teaching, but there will also be false in their living. Look at what Jesus says in in Matthew 7. He's saying this to his disciples, and he says in verse 15, Beware of false prophets. Beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You you will recognize them by their fruits. 
Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from th- thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now we'll get into more of that next week. But he says, says, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Jesus says it two times in Matthew 7. You'll recognize these false teachers by their fruits. Obviously, their fruits will not be shown instantly, but it, they will be shown over time. Eventually, you'll see that their teaching does not lead to true life change. You'll see it in the ones, their disciples, the ones who fall into the snare of false teaching, and you'll even see it within the false teachers. Neither will produce genuine life change, genuine heart change, genuine fruit. So with false teaching in the Bible and throughout the history of church, we've seen false teaching become very enticing. It can bring in droves of people. It can often be fresh or new or exciting. But over time, false teaching will lead people in shambles. And this is what we've seen even with the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is that God's chief goal for you is to be healthy and wealthy when the Bible and the followers of Christ did not see those things happen in their life, and even the life of Jesus, who grew, who lived in poverty and preached the gospel and didn't need the earthly treasures to be satisfied in God. However, the prosperity gospel teaches that if you love God enough, that he will make you healthy and wealthy. But we see this lead people interestingly enough, into more debt than they were before, into more confusion, into more despair. We've even seen our own country export the prosperity gospel into other impoverished companies, uh, countries, namely Africa, and where you've seen that come to already impoverished people and bring them into more poverty. And we've seen it time and time again where these prosperity teachers will have moral failures, greed, embezzlement, and there will be countless spoofs even in our country about prosperity preachers. You'll see spoofs like, um, like the TV shows that you see, like reality TV shows. A few years back there was one called the, like the Preachers of LA. It was about prosperity preachers and their lavish lifestyles or movies that depict these types of preachers as criminals and rightly so. Because what you've seen as the fruit is poverty, greed, and no moral compass. And this is just one example out of hundreds that we could use about how false teaching will only lead to bad fruit. It will show itself for what it really is. Because the reality is that only the finished work of Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection— And the Holy Spirit illuminating the truth of God's word will cause a genuine heart change. And everything else added to or taken away from that, the gospel of grace, is just a fabrication. So what do we do with this? How do we keep ourselves from being naive and not falling into the temptation of false teaching? How do we ensure that we aren't teaching falsely ourselves? Well, as Paul is communicating to Timothy about this church in Ephesus that he's so concerned about, which, by the way, everything Paul predicted that would happen in Ephesus absolutely happened. Fierce wolves came in, and they began to prey among the flock and lead some astray. And so Paul writes to this young pastor named Timothy who's coming to the church and he's trying to reset the church back into in its original state where it trusted Christ and Christ alone. And he says these simple words to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 verse 16. He says, Timothy, keep a close watch 
on yourselves and on the teaching. He says, persist in this. For by doing so, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. So Paul says two things, simple things. Number one, he says, pay attention to yourselves. Friends, how are you paying attention to yourselves? How are you living? Is it easier for you to say no to sin than it used to be? Is it harder to say no? And and if it is, ask yourselves why. What lies are you given into? Maybe it's the false teaching that you're allowing yourself to be exposed to. Maybe you don't even realize it. Maybe it's the false teaching that you're even feeding yourselves, that you're listening to the lies of the accusers, and you're believing these lies without applying the gospel. But pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to what's stirring and going on in your heart. And so Paul says to Timothy, Pay attention to yourselves. If you want to make sure you're not a false teacher, he says, pay attention to yourselves. The second thing he says is pay attention to what you teach. He says, and the teaching. So pay attention to what you're teaching. Oh, and we can apply it to ourselves. Pay attention to what we're being taught. This goes back to last week. Having a confidence in believing that the word of God is sufficient for us. This is why David in the psalm says that he wants to hide the word of God in his heart that he might not sin against God. Friends, you cannot combat false teaching and you cannot grow in discernment unless you grow in understanding who God is. And so church, may we not be naive. May we grow in discernment. May we have an awareness of our hearts and on the word of God. And here's the why. As a church scattered, we are very vulnerable right now. We're in a a, a time of suffering, and we're unsure of, of what's ahead of us. And it's easy to sort of give in to our own passions and our own desires, because it can be hard work to think about what's stirring and what's going on in our hearts. That it can take patience to to slow down our emotions and think about what we're receiving as nourishment or comfort for our souls. It can be easy to take things at at face value because it's more comfortable or it's less negative. So what are you running to in your comforts right now? As you're vulnerable, as your heart is vulnerable, what are you allowing to teach you and to shape you and to nourish your soul? So often we run to comforts, don't we? We say, man, it would just feel so good if I just ate this whole thing of Oreos right now. This would be comfort food for me, right? When interestingly enough, the Holy Spirit is our comforter in the Bible. But we run to comforts to comfort us or to nourish us. So we allow ourselves to, to, we allow these lies to come in and say, this would comfort me. This would comfort me if I had if I just drank and I allowed myself to numb myself, or it it would comfort me if I just looked at pornography, if it would comfort me if I just binged on Netflix and just escaped reality. And sometimes it's it's good to to take a walk, and sometimes it's good to to just sit and and have some brainless activity. I, I, I get that. But what is it that we are really running away from? It's important that we do, as Paul says to Timothy, Pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to the teaching. What's stirring in your heart? And what are you replacing that that desire, that longing for? What are you nourishing it with? Paul says nourish it with the word of God. Nourish it with the truth of God's word. Don't allow yourself to nourish it with something that is false because it will only lead to destruction. So friends, pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to what you're allowing in. And may we fight against this tendency to be naive to these things. And the reason for that is so that we will become more like Christ. And that we truly would be a wonderful, beautiful, glorious representative of him as we are the church scattered.
God, help us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this season that we have, even, even though it's hard. Lord, we trust that you are speaking loudly to us. So God, I pray that we would hear. I pray that we would hear, first of all, by paying attention to ourselves. And God, if there's sin in our hearts, if perhaps we've never, we haven't confessed, I pray that you would just give us the faith to do that, knowing that on the other side is grace, on the other side is love, on the other side is joy. And so God, give us the faith to do that. I pray for those who are listening even today that have never trusted you and trusted the finished work of Christ. I pray that you would open their eyes to the good news of the gospel, that you would draw them to you, and that you would grant them faith to surrender their lives to you. But God, for those of us who are in Christ, God, help us to pay attention to ourselves. Help us to pay attention to your word. Help us to take advantage of this time and and be in your word and be intimate with you and that we might know you, as Paul says, in the power of your resurrection. And God, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I invite you to respond to the good news of the gospel. This morning, if you are with your family or friends, that you would have an opportunity this morning to take of the Lord's Supper. If you have the elements of of bread and wine or bread and juice, that you would take the bread, and the bread is a remembrance of Jesus' body that was broken for you on the cross. You'll take the bread, and then you'll dip it into the wine, and the wine, again, is a symbol. It's a remembrance of Jesus' blood that was shed for you. And this is a chance, an opportunity that the Bible allows us to have to, to rehearse the gospel, but also pay attention to ourselves. That we wouldn't take this meal in an unworthy manner, but that we would stop and we would pause and we would ask, have I confessed my sins to God? Have I confessed my sins to others? And, that if, and as we do, we would remember how he changed us and made us new through his death on the cross. So this morning, before you take the bread, before you take the cup, would you pause and would you pay attention to what's stirring in your heart? Would you pay attention and say, have I allowed truth in or have I allowed falsehood in? Would you repent of the falsehood that you've allowed in? And would you allow your soul to be nourished by the true word of God? So this is a chance to respond to the good news of the gospel in that way. The second way I invite you to respond is through giving. And I want to invite you to do that. If you call Integrity Church your home, there's a chance you can do that online. You can give by going to our website, liveintegrity.org. You can also give through mailing a check at 569 Irish Lane in Winterville. And we just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. Because of your generosity, we have been able to continue to fuel the mission of Integrity Church by proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And so by you doing that, it helps support our staff team and our elders as we uh, desire to serve so much this city and around the world through planting churches and planting the gospel. And so we want to say thank you so much for doing that. And I'm going to challenge you to continue to do so if you call Integrity Church your home. If you don't call Integrity Church your home, we love to hear about any needs that you have uh, in this season, or if you have more informa- questions about our church, if you go to our website right on the front page of liveintegrity.org, there's a, there's a contact form there. Let us know who you are. We love to care for you in any way that we can. The last way I'm going to invite you to give, I said two, but I meant three. <laughs> the last way I invite you to give, uh, to not give, respond. The last way I invite you to respond is through um, taking time and look at those reflection questions. Take time with your family, take time with your friends, study what those mean, talk about them, pray over them, maybe journal up. Maybe it's just a time to confess. But right now, would we just take that time? Thanks again for listening. Love you, and we'll see you again online next week.